Act one, scene seven is an important scene as the final scene of act one. He, here we have Duncan has arrived at the castle and dinner is in progress. You'll hear kind of the sounds of a banquet in the audio in a minute. And Macbeth has stepped off to the side because he has a big decision. His wife is pressuring him to kill Duncan. He himself has thought about killing Duncan and it's now or never. He's got to decide, is he going to do it or not? So we see in this scene, him first contemplating by himself. A soliloquy is a scene of an actor alone on stage delivering a long speech. And so just like with an aside, he's talking only to the audience and we are hearing his internal thoughts. So pay close attention to, is he going to decide to kill Duncan? And what are his concerns? You saw some of these lines in the bell work or the warm up. If it were done when it is done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, then but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all. Here, but here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases we still have judgment here, that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to break the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which all leaps itself and falls on the other. All right, so at the end of his soliloquy then, let's break this down. He really lays out a pretty concise argument for whether or not he should do this. He begins by saying, Let's see if I can get my notes a little closer. He begins by saying that if this were all done when it was done, then it were best it were done quickly. If this could be the be all and end all, then it would be best to just go ahead and do it. So on the plus side, if it could be all over with and successful with one act, it would be worth doing. That is the first thing that he says. But then you have a but, and remember, that means something is changing here. But here are the problems. He says, here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. Jump here means risk. And so he's saying, but actions we take here, actions here on earth, affect our afterlife. So it's not just going to be over and done with. There might be consequences in the afterlife. Also, he has this line that if we teach bloody instructions, they return to plague the inventor. And so what he's saying here is the concept of karma what goes around comes around. He's basically saying if he gets the throne in blood, it might be taken from him in blood. So 
So he is hesitant to do this. He has now one reason why it would be a good idea and two reasons why it might be a bad idea. He goes on. He says that there are several problems with this. So he says, first problem, I'm his kinsman and his subject. So I owe him loyalty. And then he says also, as his host, I should protect him. He says it's kind of the job of a host to lock the door against a murderer, not bear the knife myself. And then he really gets to the heart of it. He says, Duncan has been so meek, so ethical. He has been so virtuous that there would be a deep damnation cried against his taking off, that there would be so much pity for his death, that tears would drown the wind. Duncan is a good king. He's an ethical, virtuous king, a good king. And he is well loved. So he's saying no one is going to want to then be loyal to the person who kills a good king. And so by the end of this, he concludes he has no spur to prick his sides. So basically, this is he's talking like he's a, a horse. He's um, he, a spur, of course, is what a cowboy uses to make a horse run faster. He's saying, I have no spur to bring this forward. I have no reason, I have no intent to make this happen. And he says, just my ambition, which or leaps itself. So he decides not to do it. And that is where he stands when Lady Macbeth enters. We're gonna look at that scene separately after we have had an opportunity to play our game.